meet into order. This is a working session for April the 19th. Uh, Mr. Cobb, I'll turn it over to you to discuss event, district events and activities, please. Okay. Yeah, we do not have a, a very full agenda today, and I'm very cognizant of the, of the time and everything. So uh, <clears throat> we'll try to be as, as brief as we can, but I also wanted to share some information with you. I'm sure you're probably getting some questions about supplemental years, so we can talk about a few of those things and try to answer any questions that you all have. Uh, the, the Kentucky Department of Education just updated that guidance on supplemental year on Friday and Rebecca resent that information out, I believe. And then we also um, put that updated guidance on the website. So I think instead of me just going and talking about all of that, I should just kind of open it up to you all and uh, what kind of questions are you getting from your constituents? And if there's anything that we can provide some clarity for, uh, even as of last uh, Wednesday, before, you know, uh, on, on about the time before the guidance was updated, um, there was a lot of confusion even at the Department of Education level. Even the commissioner in a call with all of the, the folks uh, made a mistake that he had to go back and, and correct. So saying all that to say, um, what questions can we help provide some answers for? Well, maybe if you could explain it to us, we'd know what questions to ask. I okay. um, I, th I think it would be helpful if you could give us a good overall of it. Okay, sure. So the supplemental year bill was passed to provide opportunities for students to uh, kind of have a do-over of this year for those who ha who want to do that. And that's K through 12. And the way that the Department of Education is viewing that do-over is it truly has to be classes that are either identical to the classes the students had this year or extremely similar. In other words, the Department of Education took this, um, and I'm not being critical when I say this, uh, okay, but they took this two piece uh, or two page piece of legislation and they created an 11 page document from it that provides a lot, a lot of frankly, some restrictions on some things. And what those restrictions do is, so if, if you have a student who is a senior this year and they graduate, they could still take a supplemental year and come back next year, but the classes that they would take next year would not be eligible to be calculated in their GPA and they would not be able to change the grade of the class. Let's say if they took a, I don't know, a U.S. history class their senior year and they got a D in it or, or whatever, and they wanted to, you know, to do better in that class, well, they could come back and let's say they get an A in that class. Um, and it's not a fantastic example because if they graduated, they wouldn't even be able to take the same class. They would have to take a dual enrolled class. But the classes have to be exactly the same or very similar to what was taken. So the, the issue that we see, let's use a different example. Let's say it's a freshman. If a freshman this year went through and took their classes and earned, let's say five credits <clears throat> this year, they could take the supplemental year next year, but they would have to take uh, similar or identical classes to the ones that they took this year and they would not be able to earn uh, credits that would replace those on top of those credits. So let's say that they, that they took Algebra 1 this year and they passed it, but with a D, and they went back and next year took Algebra 1 again to get, you know, to, to better master it, and they got a B in that class. That's fine, and that would be a replacement for that D. However, the child would not earn two of the four required math credits. They would still just earn the one, if that makes sense. So, um, so those are some of the things that the that uh, are kind of in there. The the one piece that uh, we know for a fact is is going to be a little bit detrimental, and I kind of mentioned this last Monday at the board meeting, is if any high school student takes a supplemental year and that's ninth, 10th, 11th grade uh, student this year, 
if they take a supplemental year, by the, when they get to graduation, the way in which that four-year cohort graduation rate is, is calculated is it will view that child as not graduating on time because they had to take a, what in essence is a fifth year in order to graduate. Uh, so that will impact negatively graduation rate if uh, if that's the case. In in my opinion, and this is where I, I'm I'm just going to give you an opinion. Um, I, I think this was a very well intentioned bill that the legislature passed. I think that unfortunately there have been some kind of negative unintended consequences to this. That uh, you know we all want to help kids, and 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 we want to help kids. Um, if, if they have had struggles this year. And, and I think there's a way in which we can do that without students having to take a supplemental year. I say that to say, whatever you all as a board decide to do, we're going to be fully in favor of, we will support 100%. And, and that's another kind of a difficult thing with this is you can't pick and choose on this. If, if you could, it would be very easy to say, hey, any student, you know, K through eight, that wants to supplement a year, let's let's make that happen for them and because that's that's something that would be very easy to do. And then the high school is just a little bit of a different matter because of credits and all that stuff. But you all have to decide either 100% yes or 100% no. And that's just the way the piece of legislation was written. Um, does that help at all, Belinda? I'm, I'm sorry if... I was gonna say something. Oh, you're, you're muted, Belinda, I'm sorry. Yeah, it does help. It's. I think confusing at best, and um, I don't know. I, I see where they're coming from, but whew, it's a it, lot to grapple with. So it, it is, and and I feel the exact same way as you do right now. I mean, all of us do. Um, principals, teachers, we're all just like, you know. I think the intent of this is great to help kids, but there are just some unintended consequences that we're going to have to keep in mind. I think Mr. Fletcher and, and Larry had a comment, whoever wants to go. Uh, I was going to say real quick, I, I read the the legislative part of it, and according to my everything that I read, Kentucky Department of Education is going to keep, like with the high schools, and, you know, if you got a high school student and it's going to be a fifth year or what, they, you know, take that fifth year, they was going to take that in consideration and try to do some, you know, I mean, I think this still is a moving, moving part. According to them, they was going to try to keep all that data for the whole state and how many of those. And it would be real sad, like I said, if we had, let's say we had 15 high school students, but you don't feel like that, you know, it could reflect bad on us that, but we had a lot of kindergarten students or first grade students that did, would like to repeat. And then we said no to all of it it would be a bad situation because I know of several people that I, uh, that's got young children that's going to have them repeat. And, and to add on to that, one thing I forgot to mention when I was doing kind of the overview uh, is let's say that one of our students graduates here next month and, um, and they do want to do the supplemental year. We can't delay that diploma being issued to that student. So, if they graduate on May 29th and they get their diploma and that the, the guidance from KDE says the diploma shall be issued as soon as the credits are achieved. So the, the difficult thing there then becomes, well, the, this student has already graduated. They're going to come back. And some of them, just being honest, there may be some that want to come back for sports and their sport year, whatever team that they were on, was impacted negatively with COVID and they could potentially, they could come back in the fall, they could play their fall sport and then say, okay, that's, I'm good now, I'm done. And then they would, they would leave us. That's just one of those things that, that is a possibility you need to, you know, obviously I just need to make you aware of all those pieces. So this is not an optional thing. I mean, I know it's legislation, but they're not giving districts the opportunity to choose or not to choose it, right? That's a great question. And so what they're, what they're, the only flexibility that we get is you all get to choose and say a hundred percent of the kids that apply are, are granted the supplemental year or zero percent. We're, we're not going to do it. That's, that's the first choice. The other choice is 
we can as a district, then there's some guidance in, in this documentation that we can create some policies at the district level. We have a little bit of flexibility. So what, what KD basically said is whatever course they take has to be very similar to the one that they took this year. Well, that word similar is really up to us as a district and you as a board when we create whatever policy. So if we say yes, I would, I would then come back and say, well, I think we need to have a little bit of flexibility in, in that word similar and what that means. Because again, we, we don't want to just, you know, give kids everything that they had in this same year. I think they're just going to get bored to tears. We have to have some ability to challenge them and, 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 and give them some other learning opportunities. I, I think that's what's best, you know, if, if we can do that. So that's a very good question now. I talked to some people uh, Friday, several people about the situation. And, and again, uh, I would say that, uh, as the rest of you have said, I feel like that the intent of the law was for the kids. But what the people in the community don't understand that the folks that I talked to uh, that are concerns with our schools and love our schools, they don't understand why we're going to get punished because you are, those kids are going through supplemental. So what happens is even though we're doing a good job, even though we're working with kids and giving them the best education, you're still going to get punished by saying you're not a good school because your graduation rate's down. This is something they don't understand. Why are we getting punished for kids already graduating, but yet because they go that fifth year, then that you're punished because of that. That's well, something just don't understand. Chuck, that's one of the things that I read in that legislative that, that the KD, uh, Kentucky Department of Education, is going to take all that data and put it into something. And I don't know what they're going to do with it throughout the state to show, okay, we had this many kids do this and repeat it a year and it made them go five years. So I don't think that when it comes to the end of the line, whenever that may be, that it's going to be as harsh of a punishment, you know, as punishment wise, I think uh, they go to take that in consideration. What well, I seen in the, you know, in the paper, I mean, what I was reading. And, and, and they did update that just a little bit uh, with this uh, on the 16th. And, and just to be clear, I'm going to read right from this just for a second. It says, Senate Bill 128 will negatively impact the graduation rate of schools where students remain in high school for a supplemental year. And then they kind of go in and talk about what G codes are. And that's what Larry's talking about, how they're going to um, put these kids in, in a reportable category that says these are kids took a supplemental year. But at the end of the day, it also down there says uh, what the federal government sees for this is so students who currently are in ninth grade and above who choose to remain in school for a supplemental year will not be on track to be an on-time graduate, which will lower the future graduation rates unless the students complete their diploma requirements in four years. And you're, you're a little bit hamstrung uh, if, if you're not enabling students who come back for that supplemental year to take additional credits and, you know, different things. So it's, it's going to make it, you know, I, that's one of my concerns is, and it, again, if you all as a board say, we understand this, that, that this is a negative consequence of this, um, but we see overall that this is going to help kids. Again, 100%, we will be supportive of whatever you decide. And we may not only have, but 12, you know, say we have 12 high school students total. You know, that's not going to be a big. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, uh, Sharla is, is not on the call, I don't think, right now, but uh, we had talked I'm going to make sure she's not on here before I say she. Yep. So we had we had talked uh, on Friday. And as of Friday afternoon, I think district-wide, the number who have submitted the survey, I mentioned it to you earlier, was at 89 last week. We're up to about 123 that have submitted the survey. That doesn't mean that 123 necessarily want to do it, but there are 123 that have answered that uh, are getting some additional information and things like that. When did we get, uh, I thought we were supposed to let them know about May the 1st. Is that right? 
June 1st. Yeah, so they are supposed to let us know by May the 1st, so we're right. keeping that open. And then at the May the 3rd board meeting is when you all will make the decision. We'll give you all the information. Again, that's a couple weeks from now. Uh, we'll give you the total numbers of students, the breakdown in the grade levels, and if there's been any updated guidance, and then you all will make that call on May the 3rd. We have to report to KDE by June 1st if we're going to do it or not. And if you can't come to a decision at that May the 3rd meeting, if you need to push back to the second meeting in May, we can do that also. So any other questions no, on that? This is not something we have to vote on today at all. No, 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 no. This is just yeah. a discussion. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I probably previously mentioned it, but um, again, mixed bag as everyone kind of agrees on here, but uh, the social stratification involved and in, with kids and holding some back and others moving forward is something that I've thought about. Um, that's always been a thing, you know, if you were the kid that got left behind or whatever. Um, so Again, with the intent, obviously the intent, the intent is there with good intentions, but uh, to be redundant. But uh, there are other things that I think about that are consequences of what as well. So anyway, my thoughts for what they're worth. Understood. One of the things that I think about, this is not a decision that we're picking these children. These are parents picking these children and saying a uh, parent or the, and the child together is making that decision. Any other questions on that? That's great, great discussion and great input. Um, you know, if uh, if you have a, any questions between now and the next board meeting, just give me a call and we'll try to get every question answered. I, I think there are 171 districts in the state that feel the same way that we all do right now. We're all still just a little confused and we're trying to figure this out as best we can. Um, the second thing I was going to talk about today was CARES Act funding because we do have some really good news. Um, we have talked a couple different times this year about uh, CARES Act 1 came last summer in the form of about a million dollars <throat> that enabled us uh, to buy the PPE, uh, the personal protective equipment and uh, technology and Wi-Fi hotspots and go and in, enter into that agreement with the plant board to provide internet for students and, and give hotspots to students and get computers for students. It, it enabled us to have the success that we've had this year. And we're very grateful for getting that million dollars. And we've spent about 900,000 and I think $910,000. We've got about $90,000 in that first CARES Act grant left. And we're using that over the next several months to pay the bill for the uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, which those those things have become, you know, they're very expensive, and uh, but it's it's been a need, and thank thankfully we've had the money from this grant to to pay those. Uh, at the end of the year, we will be collecting those again, and then reassessing where we are in terms of of internet moving forward and helping provide provide that for families. But that's kind of where we are on that CARES Act one funding. Then of course we got CARES Act two, which I reported to you was at uh, five point two million dollars, and the the whole intent and focus of, of that CARES Act two, since CARES Act one just had a little sliver of money for instruction, we bought a science program for our elementary schools with that. Um, but CARES Act two needs to be dedicated a uh, hundred percent, really, towards uh, direct instructional impact, and that's what we've been looking at and taking requests from our principals and from our uh, assistant superintendent uh, for, for curriculum instruction, Charla. And uh, we, we've been working on buying books, uh, buying instructional programs, and then also obviously looking at our summer school program that we're going to implement this year. We're going to fund out of CARES Act too, just to kind of give you, and also our virtual academy for next year. We're going to find out of CARES Act too. So just to kind of break down some of those uh, costs, we're, we're looking right now, we've spent about $320,000 on uh, books. We're looking to probably spend anywhere from four hundred dollars to 600000 more on additional books for our libraries, for our classrooms. We're buying classroom libraries for our elementary schools. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're 
so about a million just on books and, and things like that. We have submitted or principals have submitted requests for instructional programs, things like science curriculum, math curriculum, uh, English language arts, uh, curriculum for EL students, some digital curriculum. Uh, long story short, those uh, curriculum requests and, and uh, funding requests have come to about a quarter of a million dollars right now. Uh, we, we know we'll probably have a, a few more things to purchase out, out of those. Right now, we're budgeting out of this money about a million dollars for the summer school and about a million dollars for the virtual learning academy next year. And that, that can include some, obviously, it's going to include salaries and any curricular needs that we're going to, to spend. But that $5.2 million, we're looking at, and again, and Shane can jump in on this, for us to get an additional, I think it's about 450,000, somewhere somewhere in that 425,000, we have to spend at least 85% on the learning loss uh, that uh, may have occurred as a result of COVID. So that's why we're gearing these funds towards instruction. It will free up some more money that, that we'll get that also will enable us uh, uh, to, to make those instructional purpose, uh, purchases. Um, so all those things are, are really good things. We're really excited. Uh, it's been a windfall for us to, to have these funds. Uh, and frankly, you know, we haven't received textbook funds from the state of Kentucky for about six years. And this has been exceedingly helpful. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you a great example. ELV uh, submitted a request for a, um, um, a reading program that's about $49,000. There's no way we could have done that if we didn't get these funds. Uh, Hearn is submitting a request, Bonner is submitting a request, uh, Bridgeport has submitted a request for a similar type of a thing. So we're going through those quotes, we're trying to get the prices to, to uh, you know, a comfortable level and, and, and we're gonna be making those purchases. Now here's the, I'm sorry, let me stop there and ask if there's any questions. Yeah. Is the CARES money like some of the other money that we've gotten through the years that if we don't use it all, then we lose whatever we didn't spend? Yes, it, it is very much like that. That's exactly right. And the, the CARES Act one funds that first million dollars. We had to spend that by September of 2022. So we've almost spent the, you know, the vast, vast majority of that now. So we're on, in good shape there. The 5.2 million we have to spend by September of 2023. So again, we're, we're kind of on track for, for being able to spend that. Then just two weeks ago, we, we uh, well, it was about, actually, it was, no, it was last week, sorry. Last week at our um, superintendent webcast, we were informed by the commissioner that we're getting CARES Act 3 funds. And CARES Act 3 funds will have to spend by September of 2024 and they're in the amount of $11.69 million for our district. So it's like, uh, wow, it's, it's uh, r really a windfall. Uh, and this, these are dollars that are from the federal government that are based on your free reduced lunch numbers. So uh, that's how they're calculated. The state got $2 billion on, on this CARES Act 3. And so like for instance, Jefferson County got $400 million and we got 11.69 million. Um, so long story short, uh, we now know that moving forward all the way through September of 2024, we're going to have a very nice pot of funds that will be able to fund some additional um, things from an instructional perspective that, we, that we're going to be able to um, really help mitigate that loss and I hope thrive. And, you know, one of the, I'll just give you an example of something that we talked about. Uh, Sharla had mentioned something to me last week, at the end of last week, that something that was very, very um, uh, positive and powerful were uh, literacy coaches at the elementary school level. She had mentioned that, and her and Kyle both uh, in, in a discussion that we had said it was one of the best things we ever did. And unfortunately, it was something that went away several years ago. That's something that's on the table right now for us to look at being able to fund potentially for the next two years as just an idea and something I'll probably formally present in May. But that was something that uh, if we're able to do those things, if we again, we got to get kids reading by the time they leave 
uh, grade three. And if, and if we can do that, we're, we're going to ensure their success in life more than any other statistic that we can do. So Mr. that's Cobb. just an idea. Yeah. Mr. Cobb, yes. uh, I appreciate when you talk about the liter literacy program, especially in the reading. Um, are we going to look at possibilities of procedures for bringing volunteers back in to help in those areas where kids need to read in and encouragement? Absolutely. Uh, the community has been asking, when do you think, I say, I don't know, but when do you think that we can get back in to volunteer to help kids and read in and work with them and one-on-one? -on -one? So eventually, could you all let us know what possible procedures would be and how we'll go about doing that? We will keep you informed as 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 that guidance still continues to come in from the Department of Public Health. We will continue to listen to that guidance. Um, realistically speaking, I really think that by the beginning of, of this upcoming school year, we're going to be able to to increase and and have some of those folks that are going to be hopefully back in our buildings. Another thing uh, that uh, I think would be good to let our public know. Uh, we have spent, a, uh, from the CARES money, we have spent a lot of money to offer hotspots, et cetera. Uh, I would like to know what, uh, uh, for his analysis of what have we, how we benefit, what percentage of the kids have benefit from this, as well as what percentage did not benefit from it. Because when I hear us as board members talk, we say that we had a lot of kids failing. Well, I like to know why they were failing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what reasons they, these kids are failing? Because we say that every child is important, which we do believe that, but why are kids failing? And so if we could look at the analysis of where these hot spots were, what we offer, how it benefit these kids, I think it would show our public you know, we tried our best during this uh, during this pandemic time to help out, and that I think it'd be a plus for our district to say this is what we spend the money on to help our children and our community. And I can have Mr. Pack come at the next board meeting on May the third and give you a full report on here's the number of hot spots that went out, here's the number of people that uh, families that we had sign up for the um, plant board internet. Um, I really, you know, the, the thing that was our message from the very beginning of this is we did not want technology to be the barrier, at least in terms of a lack of access to technology. However, having said that, there are some places in our county, e even now to this point, if, that hotspots don't work very well, and we don't have direct cable access for um, high-speed internet. Since the very beginning of school, we've actually been busing students in from different parts of the county where that is the case and getting them on our Wi-Fi in our buildings. So I don't, and, and, and I'll let Mr. Pack share all of the detailed information. I really don't think that a lack of internet access was was the issue. It was more of, you know, this is a this was a very different type of instruction and, and virtual instruction was was challenging. Our teachers have done an amazing, amazing job. However, at having said all of that, if, if there's a situation where a teacher is not present with a student in, in person, it, it, there, there then are opportunities for not as much monitoring to occur, if that makes sense. You know, it's, it's, it's much easier if, if, a, if we have teachers and kids and they're in the room and if if there's something that the student is lacking, we can jump on it at that very moment. That, you know, I think, I think that's one of the biggest things that we have seen across the country uh, with this. And, and that's why it is, is being mentioned that across the country, there are a lot more failures this year. And it's simply due to that fact, which again was one of the reasons why we we're, we're very happy to be back uh, with the vast majority of our students now. Can I answer any other questions right now on any of the CARES Act stuff? The CARES Act 3 being almost $11.7 million and, and knowing we've got that two-year window in there, we're going to look at some things where we can bring in additional people. 
And that's why one of the things that, you know, we're, we're talking about is this uh, early, early literacy coaches at the, you know, elementary and middle and high, specifically the middle, middle and high, we're going to look at some mental health, um, you know, things that we can, we can provide for our students, for our social, emotional, mental health issues that we know have happened and, and increased as a result of COVID. Uh, maybe looking at some social worker, uh, some additional counselor positions. So, uh, you know, those things we're going to be bringing to you over the next few months as we kind of, we're, we're seeking some feedback from our schools and, and from our staff and from our guidance counselors, frankly, and uh, see how we can best help them help our students. So uh, those are some other areas that we're going to be looking at with these funds. Anything else from you all? Well, that is all I have on, on my uh, piece to ask about and, and to talk to you about, um, Mr. Fletcher. Does any board member have any other questions you might have for Mr. Cobb? Seeing none, is there a motion that we adjourn? Mr. Chair, I make a motion to we adjourn. Is there a second? Second. And second by Belinda. Well, thank you all. Let's have a great, beautiful day.